Okay, hi, good morning, everyone, and welcome. Thank you for attending our Planning Your Legacy One Step at a Time webinar. My name is Ashley Davidson, and I am the Chief Development Officer with the Joseph Brandt Hospital Foundation. And I am thrilled to have with us this morning two special guests, David Henderson, a partner at Agro Zafiro LLP, and Joseph Brandt Hospital's Chief of Staff, Dr. Ian Pereira. David, I'll ask you first uh, to provide a brief introduction of yourself to our audience. Sure. Thanks, Ashley. Uh, I'm a lawyer in uh, lawyer and partner at Agri Zafiro LP. It's uh, one of the larger firms in uh, downtown Hamilton. I have a focus practice. I focus on estates and corporate succession planning. So um, fancy words for uh, dealing with family businesses as they transition into selling or um, uh, passing on the, the value to the, the business onto the next generation uh, with heavy uh, experience with the state planning and administration. Great, thank you, David. Uh, Ian, over to you for an introduction. Yeah, thanks, Ashley. I'm, I'm Ian Pereira. I'm the Chief of Staff at uh, Joseph Brand Hospital. I've been Chief of Staff since 2018. Uh, my moonlighting job is I'm an eMERGE physician. I've been doing that for, seems like, 20 years and lots of hair ago. And uh, uh, I've been really fortunate to be able to work with the Foundation uh, over the years on many projects. And uh, my evening job is I'm the Team Emergency Physician for the Toronto Maple Leafs, and I have every confidence that this is our year. Okay, thank you. Great. Uh, so we're looking forward to an excellent conversation this morning about estate planning and legacy wishes, um, including how you can include your favorite charity in your plans, and as well, um, information about how to have those really important conversations with family and loved ones around estate planning and the sensitive conversation about end-of-life wishes. Um, so for our audience, if you have any questions, please feel free to type those into the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen and we'll do our best to answer as many as possible. Uh, and you'll also receive an email from my colleague, Emma Fitzpatrick, following the webinar. Um, and Eva, Emma is of course happy to connect with um, anyone anytime. If you've got additional questions or you'd like more information, please just let us know. Okay, so let's kick things off. David, I'm gonna have you in the hot seat first. Um, and I've got a two part question. So part one, um, before we, discuss the first steps to plan one's legacy. Why is it important to even consider how to plan your legacy? And for those who have already done so, to revisit and review the plan from time to time? Yeah, I, I think it's a personal choice. I, I've encountered my share of people, um, of situations where people uh, chose <clears throat> to not do any sort of planning. But I think for most people, they um, they work hard for what they've, they've established in their life and the people they care for. And it's important to take control of, um, of decisions on what happens after they're gone as far as not just their money, but as far as their own uh, remains are, are taken care of, their own, uh, making decisions regarding their person if they're incapable. It's all uncomfortable conversations for most. There are, there are some that are very comfortable with it, but for a lot, it's not something we want to think about, um, those sort of situations. But we work so hard for what we have, it's important that we take control of, of, of that rather than leave it up to just... Um, you know, circumstance to laws to generically deciding where where our, our stuff goes. That's great, David. Thanks. And what would you suggest would perhaps be a really good first step? What do, what should you do first? What's um kind of right out the gates for right, something that you should consider? Yeah, I think the two the two components is to just sit down. You know, if it's if you're doing this as a, a couple with a spouse, or if you're doing this on on your own, or if you're comfortable with your loved ones, but really just map out. Um, one, sort of what you have, that's the easy part. So in our world, call it like a net worth statement or something, because that's a big factor as to what do you have if you were to pass away? Well, what what do you have that would, you know, in the moment that would be um, something that would flow through your estate? Take stock of that. But um, more importantly, I would say it's like, take stock of like, who's important to you? Who do you want to benefit um, uh, from, you know, the first part, which is what you've accumulated. If, if, that, if your life was to come to an end, who would you want to receive that? And sometimes that's simple, you know, answer, you know, to my spouse, or to my spouse, and then my children equally. But um, depending on the first part of it about how much assets you have or how complex uh, you want to make your uh, your situation, or I guess how, how many people you care for, organizations uh, you care for, that can get a little bit more complicated into 
um, getting more creative with the planning you want to do around it. The good thing in, in Canada is we, for the most part, have complete testamentary freedom uh, in, in, uh, in what we decide to do. So, um, you know, you can do everything from the very generic, almost a default to intestate law, right to very complex, but very creative plans as, as to what happens after you're gone. Okay, great. Thanks, David. Um, so I've got another one for you. And the question is, once a person has determined what and to whom they wish to leave their possessions, they'll obviously need someone to carry out those wishes, an executor or a trustee usually. Um, what aspects would you suggest, David, be considered when thinking about who to ask to fulfill that role for yourself? Yeah, so I, th I think it sort of comes out of that first consideration as to the two components of uh, sort of the the net worth, sort of like your assets, what are your assets that you have, and also what sort of, what are, who are you leaving all this to? Um, out of that, you then need to find that right person uh, to, right persons, could be, could be multiple people or an organization to uh, carry out those wishes. So the complexity is a big component, like is the person you have in mind, you may have someone that is very close to you, you, you love them dearly, and they are even wanting to take on that role. But you need to be realistic about the complexity of what you're leaving them. If you have like a business or if you have some rental properties or um, just some very challenging beneficiaries maybe to deal with, is it the right person you're, you're setting up there? And, and I always say, maybe it's a team, like you can have two, you can have three uh, executors that, um, you know, state trustees that take on that role and maybe they can counter each other with you have the one that's sort of the glue of the family that can ease personal relationships, but then you also have the, the, the person that's good with finances and good at organizing everything too. Uh, in some cases, <clears throat> you may want to even look at, you know, getting into corporate trustees, uh, professional trustees. So that would be if you hear like the bank promoting that they want to act as a trustee. Uh, they're quite good at what they do. The, the trade-off is there's compensation entitlement that they'll want to have mapped out beforehand. But for more complex situations or where it's maybe you have people that that could do it, but they just feel uncomfortable in the role because maybe there's some management for, um, you know, certain individuals uh, be, after your death in, in trust, the trust companies could be a good fit for that. Uh, age is an obvious one too. Like you don't want to be putting on paper um, representatives, executors that are the, around the same age as you or older because they may not be available or in, in the, right, um, the right state or not alive at the time. And also um, many people, you've got to look at what are your testamentary plans there. If you're leaving, you know, funds to your grandkids, let's say, and it's being held in trust until they reach 35, there could be quite a bit of um, administration beyond your death uh, managing these testamentary trusts. So again, do you have people that are likely, do you have backups? Do you have people that are going to be likely to see that all the way through till the end? Great. Thanks, David. Okay, so my next question I'm going to pose to both of you, and perhaps Ian, you can start us and then David share your thoughts, but I think you'll each have a sort of unique perspective on this one. Um, and again, two parts. So the first part is, we know that sometimes there may come a point in life where we are unable to make our own financial or healthcare decisions. Um, so can you talk about why appointing a power of attorney is so important at these times? And part two, if you have not appointed a power of attorney for healthcare, and you end up in the hospital and you're unable to make your own decisions, how are those decisions then made? So Ian, I'll go to you first. Great, Th thanks very much, Ashley. You know, working in the emergency department over the years, I've been involved in literally thousands of resuscitations where people come in having suffered an acute uh, medical emergency. And it really is just like you see on TV. Our system is designed to do what it does really well, and that is to resuscitate people using cutting edge technology and highly skilled practitioners. When you're experiencing a medical emergency, often there is no time for practitioners to gain an understanding of your medical history, uh, and often you're not able to express those wishes yourself. In the absence of those expressed wishes, the emergency department team or the ICU team will do everything they can uh, to preserve your life. And that may mean invasive procedures like CPR and putting you on a ventilator, even if we're of the impression that those may be futile, um, often we'll default to that. 
Now, having been a coroner for many years, worked in the emergency department, one of the hardest things is doing a resuscitation knowing that the outcome is inevitable, but also finding out later that that's not what the person wanted. Right. And the in, in not being able to express your wishes when you're really sick means that we won't have the opportunity to fulfill those wishes. And so I think one of the things that's really important is that in advance of that time, that you have that discussion with the people you love, not just so that they understand what you want, but so you can take the burden off them of having to make that decision on your behalf. You know, we always ask ourselves, you know, what would he or she have wanted if he were able to make that decision themselves? And taking that responsibility for saying, you know, he would not want CPR or wouldn't want to be put on a ventilator if there was no hope of recovery um, can be a very difficult one for family members, especially um, in circumstances where there's so much else going on and there's so much emotion and there's so much fear and apprehension. And I think having that discussion in advance will give your loved ones a sense of agency. I think also it's important to be specific about some, some of the things that will guide your treatment, right? So if you're incapable, do you want to be made as comfortable as possible? Or do you want to try every mode of therapy that might be successful in prolonging your life? What kind of medications would you want to use? Would you want to have medical restraints? Who are the people that you'd want your care team to talk talk to about your care? Um, do you want to be in the hospital or would you prefer to be in hospice care uh, at the end of life? I think, you know, and I'm sure that, uh, that David will talk about power of attorneys, but, you know, one of the things that we do default to is who is the substitute decision maker if no power of attorney has been designated? And that's the person that the, your care team will turn to to make medical decisions on your behalf. And uh, I'm no lawyer, but there is uh, an order of precedence. And, and certainly your power of attorney takes precedence, but otherwise it will default to uh, a spouse or a child, um, et cetera. So I think one of the things that you can do as a service to your family uh, is to have that conversation. And you can expect if you come into the hospital for admission, even if it's for a condition where it's very unlikely that you'll have an adverse outcome, uh, your provider will always have that discussion with you at Joseph Brown Hospital to make sure that your wishes are clear and we're able to fulfill the things that you want for your care. David? Thanks. Uh, yeah, picking up on those points, I. I think you hit a really important component that, well, it's obviously very important to have a power of attorney for personal care uh, that you alluded to in order to appoint the people you think are in the best position if you're no longer have the capacity to make those healthcare decisions to make them on your behalf, whether it's a spouse or a uh, or, you know, child. Really the communication, like the sitting down and the communication is the part you can, you can write, you can even get into very specific uh, instructions within your POA, but the communication taking taking place beforehand is as important as anything. And I find, especially when it comes to usually with spouses that you're of the same generation, often you kind of have those conversations and directly you feel like your spouse has an idea of what you'd want in those very unique moments that you can't always spell out on paper. But the conversation with maybe the backups, the children, um, they don't want to have those conversations with you. They don't want to think about what it's like if they were faced with that. But it's important to kind of make sure they know it because I've seen that, as, as Ian had said, like the guilt and the pressure that they feel and just having the relief of knowing, okay, mom told me this is what she wanted. Um, you know, whether, you know, it is you want to put DNR instructions in your POA that's helpful, but the conversations, although they are uncomfortable while you're alive and healthy are much more difficult for those people to be trying to work in that traumatic situation, um, you know, under a lot of pressure with, with medical staff. So I think that's a really good sort of practical advice is to, you know, make them, you know, come over, have a nice dinner with your, your loved ones and then, and then say, okay, now we're going to talk about what I have in mind if, if something were to happen to me. And they usually do it when you're healthy. So everyone's not as, as, um, 
uh, stressed about it. But I thought that was a really good comment <clears throat> about uh, about doing that. I think it's um, also important to to make clear that there's two two forms of power of attorney um, being personal care and property. Uh, what we're talking about is making uh, your your personal care attorney making decisions regarding your your person, your health care decisions that would come into effect upon your incapacity. There's also power of attorney for property, uh, which um, in modern documents you'll see is a separate appointment, a separate power of attorney document. And that is actually comes into effect in you know, most cases, it's designed to be in effect at the time of signing. So it could be used even when you have capacity, but you need someone to make decisions regarding your, your property, being your finances, uh, your assets. Uh, and then it has language that uh, continues it into your incapacity. Um, so it's still valid upon you losing capacity, which in practice is usually when it comes, when it's being used is you no longer can make those decisions regarding managing property, but you're still alive and someone needs to do that for you. Um, the type of people that make the, 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 the right person for those two appointments can be very different. You know, I see a lot of families where they have someone, maybe they're in healthcare and they're a perfect fit to be the attorney for personal care. But then, you know, that's not the same qualities that make good power of attorney for property necessarily, uh, where it's about managing, you know, maybe they have an account in the family or something and they make a, a good fit for that, but not for the, the personal care. So there are distinct appointments and they're it's not always the right person for all those positions. Um, and uh, there can be a lot of complexity in both of those, but especially with property, it, it's sometimes people take the document very lightly as though it's just, you know, someone, I don't have to get into particulars, it's just someone to manage things. But like this can be just as involved, if not more of a role than the executor, because this could be years of managing, taking care of your assets while you're still alive, ensuring that you have a comfortable life uh, when you no longer can make those decisions. Great. Thanks, David. I think um, both your perspectives on that are very interesting. Um, yours, Ian, as a, you know, a physician, you see firsthand how these um, situations can play out in our emergency department in our hospital. And of course, on the legal side of things, David, you obviously work with many families to, to kind of work through these issues and, and sensitive topics. So thank you both for your perspectives on that. Um, we talked about this a little bit, David, but in terms of the documentation of all of this, um, how does one start the process of sort of formalizing something like a will and all of these accompanying documents that are required um, to, to be in place to have these um, these things sort of firmed up and finalized. Yeah, so uh, why don't we start with the power of attorney since we just were chatting about that. Um, you, you do not need a lawyer to to execute these documents. If you go on the, uh, the provincial website, you'll actually see they have form POAs for property and personal care available on there. And they're not bad, like they, they have sort of the meat and potatoes of, of a generic power of attorney. Uh, so you could, you know, you where, where do I see errors on the power of attorney while we're talking about that is the, the witnessing is very, very specific about um, it being valid or not. And I see that get messed up. And obviously that's a major issue because usually when it's discovered, it's because the bank is saying, or the physicians maybe are saying, this isn't even a valid power of attorney. And at that point, the the uh, grantor, the, the person that did the power of attorney, they don't have capacity now. So we're stuck with court appointed guardianship. Like what are we doing in order to get um, some sort of uh, control? So it can be a, a major problem. So the, the draft, the, that side, and then the drafting, you know, anything beyond the ger generic language is very dangerous to not have someone that's trained to sort of make sure that this isn't going to cause any red flags with third parties. And then there is just sort of the practice side, having done this for a long time with that, even if the power of attorney, you know, is is good in the sense that it, it, you, 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 you're a good do-it-yourselfer and you figure out how to do the power of attorney and work with the government form or work with a will kit version of it. Um, these are going to be, the, the reality is it's third parties that are relying on this documents, whether it's uh, healthcare <clears throat> individuals for the POA for personal care or whether it's the, this is the, the big hurdle with banks, um, lawyers down the road that if you're dealing with selling real estate like under these documents it's going to make them very concerned about seeing a document that was they have no sort of sense of like how it was completed whether the person knew what they were signing that they tend to just frankly get when they see that it was done with a lawyer and they know there's this objective person that has their own standard of care that that was uh, overseeing it so you do even if it's not fair you you can have challenges with having a completely valid POA if it wasn't done through, you know, the supervision of the lawyer. So obviously I'm a lawyer, I'm going to say that to a degree, but 
I, I do make it clear that you don't need lawyers to do these documents. Mm -hmm. uh, but it obviously it's recommended from my, my perspective. On the on the will, it's similar in the sense of obviously everyone's aware there's will kits, there's been will kits for 30 years. There's a you know ability to do that stuff on your <clears throat> own should you wish. There's holograph wills, which don't even require witnesses. There the law does provide for people to do their own handwritten wills, but that especially with just the the nature of these um, the deposit clauses getting into where everything goes, how everything is administered over over a period, um, pretty pretty dangerous to do that without the engaging a lawyer. Like the reality is, having a lawyer gives you the peace of mind. Like anything that I got a professional, and now it's on them to make sure that this is being done correctly. Now I can just sit back and focus more on uh, what I want to do as, as sort of the boss of this this process. Um, you know, if you if you're someone that has worked hard and accumulated a fair amount of, of uh, wealth that you want to make sure it goes to the right places from my perspective, it doesn't make sense to um, be frugal about spending funds or like very little percentage of funds in order to ensure that that does go exactly to where you want it to. So that's sort of not the surprising advice would be to get a lawyer to, to deal with these documents, especially if you're getting into, you know, significant value or complexity with the, the different areas I alluded to earlier. Right, great. Thank you, David. That makes a lot of sense. Okay, Ian, I'm, I'm going to come over to you again with a question. Um, and we, we started to talk a little bit um, about this, but, you know, having these discussions with family and loved ones, it's hard to do, but we know that it's such a critical thing to do. So in your experience, um, how would, do you have any suggestions for our audience today, Ian, about how we can start those conversations or the, the types of topics that um, we would want to talk about with our loved ones so that we sure that those people who are closest to us have a real understanding um, of our wishes around end of life and sort of estate planning. Yeah, you know, I think Oliver Wendell Holmes said that the biggest challenge with communication is the illusion that it has occurred. Mm -hmm. So I think it's really important to have that conversation in a planful way with the people who need to be involved. And which is to say that the best way to do it is to set aside time for that purpose while you are well, right? And then sit down and say, this is what we're gonna talk about. And the topics that you might wanna cover is, you know, would you want to have CPR or ventilation or defibrillation? Uh, would you want to have invasive chemotherapy or surgery? But also, you know, to talk about the choices that you're making around your power of attorney for personal care, to talk about how you want the family to behave with each other, how you want to have the care team communicate with the family, uh, where you want your care to take place. You know, you can say if it's at all possible, I want to be at Joseph Brandt because it is close to home. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's also important to talk about how you want your condition to be communicated to the rest of your family and to friends who may not be as intimately involved. And I think the other uh, thing that many families do that's very effective is to have a family spokesperson who takes on that responsibility for sharing information. Um, but I think, it, it, you know, David said, you know, have a nice dinner, get people over and talk about it while you're well and talk about it in a healthy way, in a loving way, uh, without urgency, without with the idea that you're talking about something that may not occur for many years to come. And then, you know, if your thoughts change and your plans change or the age of your children changes, revisit that conversation. Um, it, it, it's only uncomfortable for the first few minutes. And I think often having witnessed many of these kinds of conversations, it really helps, especially children, gain a better understanding of their parents' thoughts and wishes and values, but also allows you to reflect together as a family on your time that you've shared and what's important. And I, and I think um, it is something that can be deeply, deeply valuable. And certainly, you know, for the care team, you can see the difference uh, mm -hmm. with patients whose families have had these kinds of conversations. Um, and amidst the chaos of an acute illness, 
that island of peace, of knowing, um, you know, what mom intended uh, can really bring a great deal of comfort. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right, Ian. And I think sometimes um, parents might even hesitate to have those conversations with their adult children because they think, oh, you know, the kids don't want to talk about this or it's sad or it's scary. When in reality, probably those adult children are thinking, gee, I wish, you know, that they would bring this up with me. I wish they would have that conversation so that, you know, if something does happen, I'm not left, um, to your point, Ian, without the information I need to be able to make the decisions on the behalf of, on behalf of my parents that I, you know, I can have comfort in knowing that they would have wanted me to make. So, um, yeah, important conversations to have, certainly, and hopefully will inspire maybe some families today to, to kind of sit down and consider those things for themselves. That's great. Thank you. Um, okay, going to change gears a little bit here. Um, David, I'm sure you have worked with many clients over the years who have chatted with you about leaving an, um, a legacy gift in their will to a charity that's important to them. Um, so maybe, David, could you speak to us a little bit about different ways that a gift can be left in a will to a charity um, and whether or not it's generally more impactful to leave a specific monetary amount or to leave a percentage of the estate to a charity? Yeah, <clears throat> so I guess I'll start with, there's there's four base, basic, we'll call it. there's some, some other more unique situations. There's four basic ways to leave an asset uh, through your death. Uh, one is designated beneficiary. So that would be where, you know, life insurance policy is very common. You would name who the beneficiary directly on the policy is for that, for those funds. A lot, a lot of people do it that way, at least. Um, then there's also uh, registered um, funds such as like an RSP or a RIF. Uh, they allow for a designation. Certain other um, uh, assets do as well. A TFSA is a common one now that that's come along with the last 10 years or so, and you can name directly on your TFSA, uh, that's a tax-free savings account. You can name exactly who the beneficiaries are in that. So that's one mechanism, not overly common with uh, charitable giving to do it that way. That tends to be more, you know, spouse and, and, a, and more uh, close uh, family members. Um, and if people don't have those, they tend to just put a state and then they can get in a more sophisticated plan through the will, because then that just falls into the will, but those are assets. Second type would be a specific um, bequest, which is, um, you know, I leave my wedding ring to this individual, or I leave, uh, you know, it could be, I leave my cottage to this individual, you're leaving a specific item. Again, not as common with charities. Um, we could talk, you know, depending on time and interest about um, providing shares and some benefits of that. It would probably be the only situation where a charity makes some sense for a specific bequest. Um, then the two, the two big ones would be a cash legacy, which is just like it sounds, it's a cash amount. So I leave $100,000 to you know, charity uh, XYZ, um, or you know, um, I leave a certain amount each year. You get, get, again, there's lots of creativity if you want, want to be with estate planning, but essentially it's just a lump sum of funds that is being provided, as opposed to, as you, you said, uh, the last type would be a share of the residue. So residue is basically like the net of what you have after all your obligations, being your taxes, your uh, expenses, compensation, and it comes out off the top, uh, your your debts. Once that's all been cleaned up, and including paying any legacies or bequests and everything above it, the, the last amount is the residue. That's the net that's left over. And so leaving a percentage of that or leaving the whole the residue is the other common way to leave something to a charity. Uh, pros and cons, um, not from the perspective of charity, from the perspective of the testator, that's who I, I represent on these. Um, would be uh, cash legacies are nice and clean. They are what they are. They're you leave a hundred grand to charity, they got a hundred grand. There's no as long as they get their hundred grand, and not to get into like what happens when you don't have a hundred grand and all that. Uh, that's hopefully doesn't happen uh, very often because that's not good planning if you're not looking at the the amount the person has and ensuring that that's protected. But a hundred grand once the charity gets that, that's all they um, they really uh, are entitled to. So it makes it nice and simple. Um, a sh uh, but the same token, if you have accumulating growth over years and you don't redo your will, that charity is always just getting the hundred grand, which is maybe fine, but it's sort of the stagnant amount. Uh, leaving a share of the residue, well, it's the opposite, right? It's whatever's left. So if you have a lot left afterwards, you continue to accumulate about, you know, assets over your lifetime and you left uh, charity XYZ, uh, um, you know, 25% of your residue, well, then maybe that's going to be a considerable amount depending on what's left there, or it could be considerably less. So that that people like because then it ensures that if you leave, let's say 
you want to leave something to a charity, but you also have children you're leaving to or, or nieces and nephews you're close with. If you leave them a percentage, then you kind of always know that the children slash, you know, those other beneficiaries are not going to be left out because they'll always get the 75% of that example, mm -hmm. as opposed to if you leave half a million dollars to the charity and then you have expensive nursing care uh, towards the end of your life and you only have, you know, $501,000 after everything, all the expenses, well, the residue beneficiaries, although they're getting 100%, they're getting 100% of $1,000 because the $500,000 went to the, the charity. So residue is good from that perspective. The, the con from the testator uh, slash family's perspective is when you're a residue beneficiary, you're entitled to a lot more uh, information because you have a right to know how the 25% was arrived at as opposed to, hey, I just get the 100 grand or I get the 500. Um, what they get is 25%, um, which is very important for them to know exactly uh what happened in the administration that's called a, an estate accounting to see exactly how that amount that they're receiving was arrived at. So the charity ends up, you know, good or bad ends up with a lot more uh, power over um, or a lot more um, input over ensuring things were done correctly and everything. So um, it's really just about assessing the situation, seeing what works for the family and everything. I will say that the obvious thing is, if there's a real intent to provide to charities, I sometimes talk to families and they say, well, I'll just leave it to, you know, the, the family and then they can just provide to the charity if they want one, you know, that that's okay. I don't have an issue with that, but it's not very good from a st strategy standpoint because a lot of people have a significant amount of tax disposition on their death. And if you don't leave it directly into your will, all that benefit of the charitable, the charitable receipt coming back to offset a lot of tax is gone. Like it has to be there in the will. Um, so, um, you know, it's not great from a planning perspective if you're pretty certain that this is this is where the money is going to end up, whether I, I would be more direct and put it right in the will. Okay, great. Thanks, David. Um, okay, so continuing on our theme of, of charitable giving within our wills. Um, so, Ian, you're obviously working in our hospital every day, and I know you are, you know, have the opportunity to see firsthand how legacy gifts um, have an impact on the care that we're able to provide to our community. Can you talk to us a little bit about this impact and how these gifts help organization like ours plan for the future? Yeah, you know, Ashley, I can't overestimate the incredible impact that our donors have on our organization. And you see it as you walk by this brand new hospital that's been built and you feel it as you walk through the halls and uh, with our new MRI machines and our cutting edge surgical equipment. Um, and, you know, it, it's been said that the best kind of philanthropy occurs close to home and for causes that touch you and your family. And so our donors um, are often from the Burlington area and they see firsthand the impact of their generosity on their families and on their community. Legacy giving extends that in a way that I think is very special in that you are planting seeds in a garden that you'll never get to see. However, your children and your community and will reap the benefits of your generosity. And, and I think it really allows our donors uh, to continue to build the legacy that they did while they were alive. And to see the ripples of this philanthropic pebble that they've started thrown into the, into the lake of their, um, of their community echo uh, throughout their community after their passing. Um, and it really allows them to bring to life who they were and who their what their values were and what they wanted to contribute. You know, we've had, I'll give you an example. We've had over $25 million uh, donated to Joseph Brand Hospital from donors who left a gift uh, in their will. Um, I'll give you an example, perhaps of Howard and Betty Geis who, who left a transformational gift in their estate to Joseph Brand Hospital and their gift was targeted to provide support to the hospital's new ophthalmology department. So the ophthalmology department uh, does eye care. And in addition to doing um, cataract surgeries, they do all kinds of other eye care. And what it has allowed 
is that Burlington citizens can receive cutting edge eye care on top of the line equipment from incredibly skilled physicians and care teams in their own community. You know, we talk so much about, you know, wait times and having to go to private clinics and not being able to access care. But through the generosity of, of Howard and Betty Geis, that's not an issue in Burlington anymore because they can get the best care at their doorstep. And uh, it's allowed us to grow the program and improve access. And every person who comes in can feel the impact of the Geis' generosity. Um, even after their passing, their legacy lives on. And, you know, there are myriad other examples of this at Joe Brandt. Um, so I, I can only, uh, you know, assure our, our listeners that the, the gifts that our donors have are, are not only valued, but they are essential for us to continue at Joe Brandt to provide the kind of care that we want to uh, for our community close to home. It's great, Ian. Thank you. And yes, certainly a beautiful legacy that the Geises have left to our community. We're very grateful. Um, okay, well, we've got a few minutes left, so I'm going to move into our Q&A. We've got a couple of questions. Um, and Ian, I think I'll pose this first one to you, uh, which says, we are more often hearing in the media about patient, patients choosing MAID, so medical assistance in dying. Can you explain for our audience, Ian, what that is, how the process works, um, and perhaps share a little bit about what the experience here at our hospital has been with that program? Yeah, absolutely. It, it is something that is actually very close to my heart because over the years since I've been involved, my view on MAID has changed so much. Um, you know, I think many people myself included, were apprehensive about it because, you know, for me as a caregiver, it seemed to go counter to everything that I was taught, right? This idea of preserving life at all costs and providing excellent palliative care. And what MAID is, is for a person to express directly to their providers their wish for medical assistance in ending their life. This is not something that's delegated. It's not something that your power of attorney can do. It's not something that you can say, yes, I want this when the time comes, but rather it is you in a situation where you're faced with an illness that is life-threatening over which you have no agency, taking back some of that agency and making the choice for yourself about how you want your life to end. One of the things about MAID that has touched me so, so deeply is to is seeing the program at Joseph Brandt uh, with our physicians and uh, allied health professionals who've grown this program and how deeply it's touched patients and their families. You know, I've seen so many patients who are struggling with their illness and the pain, uh, both psychological and physical associated with the end of their life being offered made and making that choice and having the opportunity to talk to their care providers and to their families and to take back their autonomy. And it provides so much comfort in the end of life to have it occur on your terms. Mm -hmm. um, when, when you have made, there's a process that you go through, a discernment process that requires an assessment by two clinicians. You have the ability to withdraw from consideration for MAID at any time. Uh, and before the provision of MAID, you'll be asked again whether you're certain this is what you want. And the hospital team or your team in the community will work with you uh, to determine a date and time of provision that um, works for you and for your family. You can determine uh, who you want to be present. And in many cases, it gives you the opportunity to have those final discussions with your family in a planful way, in a more peaceful way, without being an extremist and without having to ask anyone to make snap decisions on your behalf. And, and it takes away, I think, from families, the bitterness that when you're gone, they ask themselves, did I make a mistake? Because it puts the power where it belongs. The power over your, over your body and what happens to you stays in your hands. 
Um, you know, the other thing that we have uh, been able to do with MADE is marry it with our Trillium Gift of Life program so that if you are eligible, you have the ability to donate your organs while receiving MADE. And for many patients and families, this is great comfort knowing that while their life may be ending, they're contributing to saving another or, or six, up to six lives. So it, it, it's something that is scary to think about when you don't know. But once you know about it, it's something that is very profound. And in many cases, um, brings a great beauty to the end of a life well lived. Mm -hmm. And um, again, allows your family to move on from your legacy in a way that would be very different than if you were torn from them by the vagaries of an illness over which you had no control. Right, thank you, Ian. That's a very um, thoughtful perspective on that. So appreciate you sharing that. Uh, with us in the experience that we've had here at Joe Brandt uh, thus far with that program. Uh, thank you. And so uh, that brings us to the end of our sort of formal program today. I want to thank Ian and David so much for joining us today and sharing a lot of really helpful information and I think laying some really great um, seeds with people to think about and sort of carry forward and consider their own planning and their own wishes. Um, and, you know, I think probably laid some groundwork for folks to have conversations with their loved ones, which I think is such an important thing. So really appreciate both of your participation today. Thank you very much. Um, if our audience has additional questions or would like to chat with anyone at the foundation, um, again, there's lots of information on our website at jbhfoundation.ca, or please feel free to reach out um, to any of our team members, and we'd ha be happy to provide information and answer any questions you might have. And with that, I will wish everyone a really great Wednesday. Um, and thank you both again for attending today. And thank you to our audience for attending. Appreciate you being here. Thank you very much, Ashley. Okay, thanks, everyone. Take care.